that's you, just say, I receive it. There's healing at the altar. There is love at the altar. There is love at the altar. Some of you, you feel like no one loves you. But there's love at the altar. You feel like no one sees you. There is love at the altar. There is love at the altar. He's wrapping his arms around you. There's love at the altar. Jesus is at the altar. Jesus at the altar. Jesus is at the altar. Jesus is at the altar. So come, just come, just come. He's here. Jesus is at the altar. And he's calling you. Jesus is at the altar. There is healing. There is healing at the altar. Healing rain, healing rain, come down. There is healing at the altar. Healing rain, fall down. Healing rain, fall down. There is healing. There is healing at the altar. There is healing at the altar. arms are wide open. The Lord is at the altar. And he says, bring your cares, bring your worries. The Lord is at the altar. Some of you have said, God, I want to feel your presence again. The Lord is here. The Lord is at the altar. Jesus is calling your name. Jesus is calling your name. Jesus is calling. Jesus is calling your name. Jesus is calling your name. Jesus is calling your name. Jesus calling your name. Jesus calling your name. Says, Come, my child, come. Jesus is calling your name. He knows you by name. Yes, Jesus is calling your name. He says, come. He will turn it around. Just come. Yes, Jesus is calling your name. He knows your worries. Jesus is calling. Jesus is calling your name. is calling your name. The Lord is at the altar. 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 Just one more time. Jesus is calling my name. Jesus is calling my name. He says, I need you. I've called you. Jesus is calling my name. Oh, he says, I've put my spirit in you. I need you. Yes, Jesus is calling my name. Jesus is calling my name. 
for such a time as this for such an hour as this Jesus is calling Jesus is calling my name Jesus is calling my name city of God Jesus is calling my name Jesus is calling my name My victory is your victory For you who are faithful, be faithful still. For you who are holy, be holy still. My victory is your victory. It is in my path I will lead you. I am with you. It's yours, but I'm the one who's leading you. I have won the victory for you. Be holy still. Be faithful still. Lord, do not throw in the tower, because I am with you. I will strengthen your arm to the end, to the end, to the end. Call them, call them Messiah. The harvest is mine. I am the Lord of the harvest. Look up to me. It is I who have won this victory. And I will give you your victory. Walk in my victory. Is it a pain? I have overcome the pain. disappointment is greater than I. Nothing is above me. Nothing is above me. No one is above me. Learn about the country. I'm above everything. Look to me. Look to me. Look to me. You will not be afflicted for the second time. I have overcome. upon me and I will give you rest your rest is in my hand it is I it is I it is I I am your rest no water shall overcome you no water shall overflow no water will cover you because nothing can overcome me. And I'm in you, and you are in me. Yeah, where I am, that's where you are. Be confident today. I am your God. And no water will overshadow you.
deception. That's about to take place. God said. said you've been holding back too long and it's about to come out. That's going to start today. The prophet said, did you? I watched the Lord put a chalice in front of you and you started taking a drink out of it. The Lord said, drink it all. Drink it all. Don't let nothing, nothing, nothing. Started singing one song. I see, like, a, if you ever seen the car out in the sun, how the wave, the heat comes up off of it. That's what was taking place in here this morning. They started singing, like, the wave of glory is going to float in the house. And as I watched, Every, that every sick disease is attacking this is attacking this body is cursed. It's a curse from the to do. The vision hasn't come, come to pass yet. The people in this house are supposed to be in that vision. They're supposed to get it started. We've got to be praying for more the vision. If we went out of this house and we went out of our new house. One where we can serve, serve Hagerstown a lot better. stifled down here. Need to be in this house. We need to call that forth. We need to call that new house forth. We have served a Savior that's alive. Let's call that vision forth now.
worship started, the angels were all into the field. And they were putting things into people's hands, different things. And I saw one of the things I, 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 the Lord showed me, the gentleman that was kneeling there. I heard the Lord say, tell him it is not impossible. It is possible. So whatever it is, God said it is possible and do not be afraid. It is possible. And I saw when the Lord put a sword into the both of your hands. It's a sword. I mean, real physical sword were in their hands. In the name of Jesus. And I saw when Prophet Bill's shoes, they took Prophet Bill's shoes off and put a new pair of shoes. And as the Lord was moving, just putting things in that, oh my God. I saw the prophetess Linda when they put, it, it was something like, a, you know, the cloak, cloak that they put on your shoulder, it's just like, oh God, something so The Lord is in the house. Whoa, Jesus, thank you, Lord. around and just giving everybody something. And there's so much that I have to say, but I have to be people individually to tell them. God bless you. And that was what the Lord showed me. Amen. I hear the Lord say, he said, the sword, he said, use the sword. Use it and have no fear because he has sent you. So use the sword. I see a daughter and a father reuniting. This person and the parent have been far apart a long time. But I see the father coming back to the daughter. And they're holding hands. And they were joy and tears into their eyes. I don't know who you are, but it's going to happen. We give God the praise. Get Jesus the praise. I see a young man standing like he feels alone. The Lord said, you're not alone. He said, what you are going through is going to be over shortly. He said, be faithful. Stand your position. He says, stand your position. Don't go out of character. He said, because the place you are right now is like the enemy is doing everything to make you lose your confidence in him or to lose your character. He said, don't go out of character. Look up to him. Amen. Amen. I see a housewife. The Lord said, don't give up. It appears like it's not going to get together. He said, but he is in control. He said, you are at the point of giving up. He said, don't give up. He said, the light is just before you. He said, stay on your knees. He's coming soon. And you will come out with victory. Because he held fast to what is true. I see broken hearts today. But I saw the Lord holding somebody who heart is wounded. 
and I'm wondering why he held the person so long. She said they need to come closer, so I'm holding them to let them know that I love them and I know where they are. He said he has not forgotten me. So God be all the glory. Amen. States. And in, in the center of the United States, the very center, the cross fell down within it. Inside of it, it sunk down in it. The land all around, all the states, was so dry and parched and cracked. There, there was no life. It was so dry. God. And then I saw the blood. I saw the blood in every place that the land was dry and cracked, the blood coming out of the cross. Like it was sealing those cracks and it was bringing healing in throughout, and like veins going throughout the entire United States. Just would like to just uh, make a quick announcement. Um, if you're sitting in the front rows, just want to um, just give you a, a, a respectable heads up that the dancers will be using flags. So we just want to make sure nobody gets hit by the flag. If you do get hit by a flag, it's because we love you. Don't
Oh, come on, y'all can do better than that. That was powerful. My goodness. Wow. They had me wishing I was part of the dance team. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Well, beloved, we want to welcome you this morning to the city of God. Those of you also watching online, we'd like to welcome you this wonderful, wonderful resurrection morning. Can you say amen this morning? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Uh, before we pray and get into the word, um, church, let's just take another minute and let's just lift up our pastors. Let's pray for Pastor Brett, Pastor Terry Ann. As Elder Bill were saying, Elder Bill was saying that um, they are, they've been battling um, this sickness. So we're just going to release the healing power of the Lord in this place this morning. So Pastor Brett, Pastor Terry Ann, we know you're watching online. Just receive, just stretch your hands, church, this morning. Just begin to release your faith. Lord, touch them where they are right now. We release the healing virtue of Jesus right now. Your word says that by your stripes that they are healed. And we declare healing in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray strengthen them. Not only their physical bodies, strengthen their mind. Strengthen their spirit, Lord. Strengthen their hearts right now. Lord, whatever it is that you're doing, oh God. Father, do it for your glory, Lord. Do it for your glory that even when they return, they will be refreshed. That even when they return, they will be full, oh God. Thank you for their lives, Lord. Continue to increase in them, Lord. Cause them to grow more in wisdom. Cause them to grow more, oh God, in authority. Cause them to grow more in influence, Lord. We pray let your spirit, oh God, touch them in a mighty way, Lord. Let their lives never be the same, Lord. Take them to higher heights, oh God. Take them to deeper levels, Lord God. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you have your Bibles this morning, if you can turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapters 15. 1 Corinthians chapters 15. 1 Corinthians chapters 15. And I want us just to read from, our, uh, from verse 14 to 17, but um, let's start in verse 12. 1 Corinthians 15, we'll just start at verse 12. And we just want to pay attention to verse 14 and verse 17. So 1 Corinthians chapters 15 and verse Beginning at verse 12, the Bible declares, now if Christ is preached as raised up from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, Christ has not been raised either. Verse 14, but if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. And also we found, we are found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if after all. Then the dead are not raised, verse 16. For if the dead are not raised, Christ has not been raised either. But if Christ has not been raised, your faith is empty and you are still in your sins. Father, we just thank you this morning, Lord. You are our teacher. Holy Spirit, we rely upon you. Just speak to us this morning, Lord. Make your word be spirit and life this morning, Lord. Let it produce fruit in our lives, Father. Be glorified this morning, Lord. Shut our ears to any flesh this morning, Lord. And by your spirit, Lord, you bring your word to life this morning. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. As we are celebrating Resurrection Sunday today, as some would call Easter, many around the, the world are celebrating this exact moment. They are preaching from the pulpits and 
our teaching about the resurrection of Jesus. And this morning, I wanted to do that as well, but my prayer is that each of us will understand that the resurrection of Jesus is not limited to a day. It is the very core message of the Christian faith. And this is what Paul here is communicating to the church at Corinth. Paul simply says, if Jesus has not raised from the dead, then our preaching, everything we do in the name of the Lord is in vain. If Jesus has not risen. One of the things that we can understand just from this is that Jesus rising from the dead was not optional. It was necessary. Because if Jesus does not rise, then we have no hope. In this book here, we know that the Corinthian church was a very carnal church. But in this sense, many were worried. Many, some did not believe that there was a resurrection. And some were worried about what would happen to their loved ones who had previously died. And here Paul, he takes the opportunity to speak here to the church and to remind them that there is a resurrection from the dead. That those who have died first, that they will meet the Lord in the air. And those who are living will then meet the Lord. And in the twinkling of an eye, we shall all be transformed and given new bodies. The resurrection is the very core and the foundation of our faith. Without the teaching of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, there is no gospel. There is no good news. And I believe, beloved, that it is critical that the church, you and I, that we are constantly and consistently proclaiming that Jesus died, Jesus was buried, but Jesus rose. This is the message. This is the very foundation of the gospel. Is there evidence of the resurrection. We can tell people about the love of God. We can bring people to church, praise God. But in this essence here, in this passage, what the Apostle Paul is speaking of, it's not something that words can satisfy. Action is needed. Evidence is needed. And I believe that this morning, in our declaration, as we are saying that Jesus has risen from the dead, that Jesus has conquered death, it's important, beloved, that you and I are not only able to proclaim it, but we're also able to prove it. That we're also able to prove it. I want to ask you this morning, as I ask myself this morning, beloved, Did Jesus rise from the dead? And if he did, can we prove it? I want us all to think about that. If Jesus rose from the dead, can we prove that? Our generation today, they are looking for a sign. They're not only looking for what comes out of our mouth, they are asking for the evidence of our faith. Hear me this morning, beloved. What is the proof of the resurrection? If Jesus has risen, what then is the proof? And that's what I want to focus on this morning. I'm going to give you several different evidences for the resurrection. It's not only for today, but I believe, beloved, 
That even as we go out into the world from our workplace to the store to dealing with our neighbors, dealing with unsaved family, that there will be times, beloved, where we will be required to explain our faith. And those who God will lead us to need to know that our faith is not only something we declare, but our faith is something that comes with evidence. When it pertains to the resurrection, the resurrection is not only an issue of faith. If someone asks you, did Jesus rise? And they say, well, how do you know? And if we tell the person, well, just, I just believe that. Beloved, hear me. There is enough evidence to prove that Jesus rising was not only a matter of faith, but it actually took place. And there is evidence to support it. And that's what I want to give you this morning. Hallelujah. The first proof that Jesus has risen from the grave deals with the early accounts that were written concerning Jesus' death and resurrection. Proof number one deals with the early accounts that were written, that was written pertaining to Jesus' death and resurrection. I want to share some facts with you this morning, beloved. After the resurrection of Jesus... It is historically proven that the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were written 40 to 65 years at the max after Jesus' resurrection. How many years? 40 to what? After the resurrection of Jesus, majority, most of the Apostle Paul's letters were written 18 to 34 years after the resurrection. Here's what that means. Paul's letters were written, most of them, before the Gospels were written. The Gospels were written 40 to 65 years after the resurrection. Paul's letters were written 18 to 36 years after. After the resurrection. Now, here's why that's important. Because when we are looking at the claim of the resurrection and we, and we say, what evidence is there? When we're looking at the gospels, we're not only looking at these four, at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're not looking at them in terms of their one book. The Bible is not just one book. It is 66 different books. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are separate books written by separate people based on their account of what they saw. And so when we're looking at historical evidence, one of the things that Bible scholars and scholars will do, they will look at how authentic an eyewitness's account is, or in other words, how close the account is to the actual events. Do you know in history, how many of you have heard of Alexander the Great? He was a great leader. He was a, 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 a brilliant, uh, uh, um, had a brilliant military mind. In history, he is recorded, he is spoken of. There are two individuals. One was a Greek philosopher. Another one uh, uh, um, was a Greek writer. And both of them, wrote, it is their account that we typically use today to prove that Alexander the Great, he existed, and many scholars will use their account to solidify his life. But what some of us may not know is that when it pertains to Alexander the Great, his account was not written until three to four hundred years after he died. How many years? This is the earliest account that we have, three to four hundred years. Now, here's the problem with that. When a person has died like Alexander has, and three to four hundred years later, two writers begin to write about his lifestyle, who is there to investigate their claim? Who is there to investigate 
what they're actually writing is factual. No one is there. Now, what makes the Gospels unique here is that after Jesus dies, the account of his life, his death, his burial and resurrection was written 40 to 65 years later. Here's what that means. Many of the people who the writers, many of the, the people who were alive during Jesus' time were still alive while the books were being written. Here's why that matters. Because whatever the gospel writers were writing, it could be investigated. The church could come forth and refute anything that was written. They could correct anything. There were people who were still alive during that time who could come and check the documents, come and check what was being written. Until this day, there is no one who has come forth in all of history to refute the information that has been written pertaining to the word of God. Forty to sixty five years. Evidence number one, the early accounts. Someone says, How do you know that Jesus has risen from the dead? How do you know that the resurrection actually took place? Well, let's, let's look at the early accounts. The early accounts that were written pertaining to the resurrection could be verified because many of the people were still living at that time after his death and resurrection. It could be verified. Come on, tell somebody, it can be verified. Evidence number two. How many of you have ever heard somebody tell a really good story? I mean, they, they just wild you with that story. But something in you felt like, I got to talk to somebody about this one. Something in you felt like I need to verify. How do we tell someone that Jesus has risen? The second evidence says that we have eyewitness account. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to share with you what that actually means when we say we have eyewitness account. I was doing some reading about people who have um, become martyrs, not in the Christian faith, people who have given their lives for their faith and for their beliefs. And something I found that was very interesting is that most of the people, a very consistent trait that I saw, and it was the fact that many people who, non-believers, who martyr themselves for what they believe, what they die for, someone else gave it to them. Someone else taught it to them. Did you hear what I just said? Someone else gave them that belief. Now, there's something very unique about the eyewitness accounts pertaining to the resurrection of Jesus. There are some people who will say, well, you Christians don't know what you believe. Because even though the apostles, many of them, they died very horrendously, they were tortured, many of them. Some will say, well, they died simply because they believed what they believed. They were convicted. Anybody can die for what they believe. So some would look at the resurrection account and say, it's nothing more than that, just a bunch of People who were fanatics about Jesus, and they went to their deaths believing what they believed. Now, here's the problem with that. We said the, the second evidence is of the resurrection is what? Eyewitness account. The issue with that theory is that the disciples here, and we'll use Paul, Peter, and James, the brother of Jesus, they were not taught what to believe by someone else. Meaning, 
When it pertained to the death of Jesus, no one came to them and said, hey, listen, I want to share something with you. No one shared the gospel with them. No one came and invited them to their church. No one invited them for a prayer meeting and said, come and learn about God. No. Their encounter did not come secondhand. It came firsthand. They were eyewitnesses themselves to the Lord Jesus. So there are some who will say, how can these men go to their graves believing in something that did not happen? Well, we must question that and say, how could they not? When you've seen Jesus, you forget about your life. You forget about your life. Jesus even says it. The one who finds his life will lose it. But the one who loses his life for my sake will what? Find it. These men went to their graves willingly because they found him. They saw him. You see, when you've encountered Jesus yourself, no one can take that away. People may come with their doctrines, their teachings, and, and in all of this, the culture may shift. But when you have experienced Jesus, you, you remain solid. They were willing to go to their death because of what they encountered, what they saw. I want to show you something. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. Let's read from verse 3 to 8. Look what the Apostle Paul says here. 1 Corinthians 15. In verse 3 to 8, we're talking about the eyewitness account. Paul says this, for I passed on to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised up on the third day according to the scriptures, verse 5, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the 12, you see the eyewitness accounts here? Jesus reveals himself to Peter. He reveals himself to the 12. Verse 6, then he appeared to more than how many? 500 brothers, but here's the key, at the same time. Here's why that's important. Because there is a, an argument against the resurrection that scholars use. And you know what they will say? They would say, Jesus couldn't have risen from the dead. You know why? Even though the Bible just says, not only did he reveal himself to Peter and the 12, but 500 people, they will say, well, here's, here's the argument. You know, when you lose someone, you go through a process of grief. And in that process, you allow yourself to think anything, to see anything. This is what scholars use as an argument against the resurrection of Jesus. And to make it more specific, they call it, these 500 people were hallucinating because they were grieving. That they didn't actually see Jesus, but that they were in such despair, they made themselves see Jesus. Now, if it was one of them, we, we could debate that. Two, but 500. At the same time. Now, y'all remember when we were kids? One person gives information, passes it to the next person, and by the 10th person, that information, what? It changes. Eventually, the truth is going to come out. 500 people claimed to have seen Jesus at the same time. If this was a lie, then at some point in history, the truth would have come out. Someone would have said, you know what? We had a secret meeting and all decided that this is what we were going to do. But we have no record of that. We have no record of it. 
You cannot confuse someone who has seen for themselves. You cannot lead someone astray who has tasted themselves. The eyewitness account. Paul goes on and says, he says that, In verse 6, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at once, the majority of whom remain until now. But some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as it were to one born at the wrong time, he appeared to me. How do we know that Jesus truly rose from the dead, that the resurrection actually happened? Because we, historically, we have eyewitness accounts of more than 500 people, of the Apostle Paul, of James himself. We have eyewitness accounts. Do you know that 1 Corinthians chapters 15, this verse 3 to 8 that we've read, this is probably one of the most controversial scriptures in the Bible, according to Bible scholars, and here's why. Because even scholars will admit today that that passage that we just read, they believe it happened 10 years after Jesus' resurrection. 10 years after. This is when it was written. This is what most scholars believe. This passage right here. If I'm sharing my faith with someone and I'm telling them that, yes, have faith in God. But for a person who has questions like me, I have, I, I have a response there. There's evidence that I can show you historically that this account here was written 10 years after the death and the burial of Jesus. And yet here, Paul says, 500 people saw Jesus. How do you explain that? Hear me, beloved. It is not only the eyewitness accounts from the Bible, but I'm going to give you some names here that you can look up for yourself. I'm going to give you some names historically. People who are non-believers in history who have written concerning this very event here. There was someone by the name of Tacticus. Tacticus. This is what he wrote. Tacticus, he mentions Emperor Nero in his writing. Now, if you don't know who Emperor Nero is, Emperor Nero is the one responsible for persecuting the Christians after Jesus died, after after. Um, he died. Emperor Nero is typically the one who truly persecuted Christians, put many to death. Well, this individual here, Tacticus, who was a Roman historian, he mentions Emperor Nero persecuting Christians to silence them. Tacticus, this is what he writes. He says that Christ, at the hands of Pontius Pilate, suffered the extreme penalty of Roman crucifixion. This is someone who is a Roman historian. He writes that Christ, at the hands of Pontius Pilate, suffered the extreme penalty of Roman crucifixion and that a mischievous superstition broke out in Judea and Rome concerning him. This Roman historian writes that he acknowledges the Christ, Jesus, that he was crucified by Pontius Pilate. And after he was crucified, this is how he words it, a mischievous superstition broke out. It broke out in Judea and it broke out in Rome. They tried to silence it, but they could not. Now, if Jesus was still in the grave, no mysterious superstition would break out. But we believe, and scholars believe, that the mysterious superstition that this Roman historian is writing about 
is that of the resurrection of Jesus. Josephus, second name. Josephus was a first century Jewish historian. And in his Jewish antiquities, he mentions Jesus two times. But I'm only going to focus on the one. Josephus says this, he called Jesus a wise man. If indeed, this is the exact words, Jesus is a wise man if indeed he is a man. This is Josephus now, a Jewish historian. He's not a believer. So he's writing this account here, all right? He's from the first century. He says, he called Jesus, is a, he said Jesus is a wise man if indeed he is a man. Jesus, listen to the wording, he performed surprising features. This is what he knows to be true. Jesus performed surprising features. We may say miracles, works, supernatural things. This is a non-believer documenting this. He says that he was condemned to be crucified. Despite this, his followers continued their discipleship and became known as Christians. If Jesus has not risen, his followers would not continue to follow. Here's how we know. Because when he first died, many of them were discouraged. But then something happens. Where those who were discouraged all of a sudden are standing in the city gates willing to go to prison, willing to die. Something took place. And that something is the resurrection of Jesus. They remain committed followers of Jesus. Because when you have seen the beauty of God is that he allows you and I to enjoy him together. When we come together like this, he allows us to enjoy him. But beloved, hear me. As wonderful as this is that we can corporately enjoy God, there is nothing like experiencing the Lord for myself. There's nothing like hearing his voice. There's nothing like him visiting in a dream. There's nothing like him leading and guiding. There's nothing. When you have tasted of Jesus, it is hard to like anything or want anything else. Even for the believer who may struggle to say, God, I love you, but I'm struggling with this thing. I'm dealing with this thing. You see, oftentimes what the brother or sister who is struggling in that sin, what, notice the key word I said. What are they doing? Struggling. When you've tasted of the Lord, no matter how much you're struggling, he will bring you back. You can't stay over there. When you taste it, it's hard to go back. When they saw, they couldn't go back to being timid. If we place ourselves in their shoes, Jesus was their everything. They worshipped him. They knew who he was. And throughout his ministry, he's constantly telling them, I'm going to die, but after three days, I will be raised. And they weren't hearing, they weren't hearing, they weren't hearing. And even leading up to his death, Peter, his closest, ran. James, his own brother, did not even believe in him. His own brother. If I'm a skeptic, that's one of the first things I'm going to point out. How do you claim to be God and your own family don't believe in you? If I'm a skeptic, I'm going to point that out. I mean, it's one thing if the world doesn't believe in you, but your own family? James didn't believe in him. Paul. Paul was persecuting believers. 
in the name of God. So how is it that Peter, who ran from Jesus at his most critical hour, Jesus tells him, Peter, I've prayed for you. I've prayed for you. How is it that he calls the one who ran, and now all of a sudden he's leading the church? How is it James, his own brother who didn't believe in him, and yet something happens, and now James is the leader of the church at Jerusalem? How is it this man called Saul of Tarsus, who was persecuting believers, all of a sudden gets converted? How do we explain that? A hallucination? That doesn't work. They saw something. They experienced something. And I believe the greatest explanation that we have was they saw the risen king. They said, my God, this is real. This is true. His own brother who didn't believe now is not only just believing, but now he becomes the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And then he dies a martyr's death. The apostle Paul gives his life. Do you know that Paul documents in Galatians, I believe it's um, Galatians chapters 1 verse 16 to 18, Paul talks about his conversion. When Paul encounters Jesus, you know what he does? For three years, he goes to Arabia. Then another three years later, he returns, and then he goes to Jerusalem. What does he go to Jerusalem for? He goes to go find Peter and James. The Bible says, this is in Galatians 1, I think 16 to 18. He sits with them for 15 days. Ask yourself, why? Paul went to investigate. I believe that between Paul and Peter and James, how ironic, the three of them each have a history. I believe that in their circle, Paul is saying, tell me what you saw. I'll tell you what I saw. For 15 days. After that now, Paul leaves and he does not return again for another 14 years. At this point, I believe in that meeting that's taking place, Paul is making sure that his experience is lining up with what they're saying. Hands are laid upon him. You see later on him and Barnabas and hands are laid upon them. And now they're taking the gospel to the Gentiles. Fourteen years later, he comes back now. And now he's making sure that we're still in alignment with what we're declaring. But this was his encounter. This was his eyewitness testimony. I ask you, beloved. Not what has your neighbor seen. What have you seen? What have you encountered? This man did not believe in Jesus. He didn't believe in Jesus. So what changed him? He saw something. And we know the Bible tells us on this, on the road to Damascus. The Lord says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He not only speaks to him, but he blinds him. Takes away his vision. What an encounter. And if it doesn't end there. Then the Lord visits him in a dream and, and shows him a man would come and lay hands upon him. This man called Ananias. Even Ananias was afraid because he knew the reputation of Saul. Hear me this morning. Some of us, don't be surprised who God delivers. Don't be surprised who God saves. 
Pray for people. Don't look down upon anyone. Because the very people who we undermine and look down on God will raise up and use them for his glory. And Ananias was scared. But he came. It was Ananias now who came and now presented Saul at the time to the other disciples. And then eventually you begin to see Ananias is no more. And now all you hear about is Saul and Barnabas. Barnabas, the son of encouragement. Something happened. He saw something. What have you seen? What have you seen? For the sake of time, I, I again, I, I can give you different evidences. But one thing I've come to realize no matter what evidence that I will share with you, I can talk to you about the, I, um, the testimony of the women, why that was so important. Why that was so important that it was the women that saw Jesus when he resurrected. Here's why that's important. Because in that culture, Jewish and Roman culture, men look down upon women. Especially to testify about anything. So for the gospel writers, each of them, to talk about that the women were the one who saw Jesus, the people in the world would be looking and say, these men are crazy. Because if they were smart, they would have said it was the men who saw Jesus if they wanted to lie. But the fact that they didn't say it was the men who saw Jesus and it was the women meant that they were speaking the truth. I can, I can share with you that. We can talk about the evidence of the empty tomb and what that would mean for Roman soldiers. What's interesting is even after the Roman soldiers go, go to the high priest and tell them his body's not there, the high priest said, okay, we'll, we'll say that his disciples stole his body. Notice, they could not deny the fact that his body was not in the tomb. They couldn't deny it. All they could do is try to come up with something to divert people's mind and to say that his disciples stole the body. Well, that doesn't add up because if his disciples stole his body, they wouldn't want to hide it. If he's risen, they would want to show him in front of everybody. So that doesn't add up. How many of you heard of the evil twin theory? Oh, y'all haven't heard that one? That the reason why Jesus' body was not in the tomb is because some way, somehow, he had an evil twin that looked just like him. And when they, <laughs> people are crazy. They will come up with anything. These are actual theories scholars use. Then there's the one with the alien. I'm telling y'all, these are actual theories. Because there's no explanation. I can, I can talk to you about how is it that the church all of a sudden exploded. Peter preaches and 3,000 people get saved. If you follow what he preached in the book of Acts 2, he's preaching the resurrection. That Jesus rose. The same Jesus who they crucified, he has risen. 3,000 people get saved. The church explodes. How do we explain that? If not but for the resurrection. Here's what I want to end saying. I can give you evidence upon evidence. The idea here that Paul is coming to is not so much of just, just the evidence or, or here are the facts. No. The emphasis here is that here is the evidence, but will you believe it? Will you be loyal to what you've seen? And I believe for each and every one of us, the same is being asked of us. What we have learned, what we read, do we believe it? 
That's what it all comes down to. It's not how well we speak about the scripture. It's how well do I believe what the Bible says. That's what the Lord is looking for. So how do we know that Jesus has resurrected? Because we have proof. There is evidence. But what's more important than the evidence? Is belief. Beloved, do you believe that Jesus was the Son of God? God's sacrifice, God's lamb, sent to be punished on your behalf, to take your sin upon himself, to die a gruesome death, only to be raised. I know I'm over time. I, I just got to share something. I'm going to show you how savage Jesus is. See, you've never heard that before. Y'all say, what do you mean Jesus is a savage? He was a savage. In the book of 1 Peter, we're talking about Jesus dying. He's, being, he's buried, correct? He's in the grave. How many days was he in the grave? Three. What was he doing? In Peter, the Bible says, Peter mentions about Christ preaching to souls who are in prison. <laughs> I've searched the Bible for that term, Old Testament, and it's not there. Souls in prison. In doing some research, I discovered that many of the writings in the scripture, the disciples were aware of their, what was happening around them. Many of the viewpoints that were there. What Peter does is he uses this example. He brings up this idea of souls being preached to. What was Peter talking about here? Do you know that at that time, many people, they were aware of this individual by the name of Enoch. Who's ever heard of Enoch? Do you know that at that time, there were people who believed that there were angels, fallen angels, Genesis 6, you can see this, that committed unthinkable sins. And as a result, they were put into prison. The book of Jude speaks about angels who are being held in prison. Have you ever read that? Peter, knowing that the readers, his listeners, have knowledge of this, he uses the example of Enoch to get something across about Jesus. Enoch, this is what many knew at that time, that these angels, they asked Enoch, because he walked with God, to petition God on their behalf to release them from this prison. And so the, the story goes that Enoch, he went to God and said, God, release these angels from the prison. And guess what God said? No. Your judgment is final. What did he say? You will not get out from there. Peter, knowing that his listeners are aware of this, he then uses Jesus as an example. And he says, Jesus descended, but he doesn't say he preached the gospel. He said he preached to the souls. The souls that Peter is talking about is not humans. Peter is saying, Jesus descended and went to where these angels are. And it's telling them, your judgment is final. You will not get out from here, but I will. He's a savage. You will remain here, but I will rise from here. This is even connected to baptism. Do you know when you are, I'm too big to be laying on the floor, so y'all got to imagine it up here. When you're being baptized... When you're, being, when you're going down, 
Do you know that is symbolic of spiritual warfare? You are declaring to the powers of darkness, you will remain here, but I will rise. This is why when Jesus has an encounter with the demon, you know what the demon says to him? Have you come to torment us? Because what was he doing? Tormenting them, telling them, you will remain here, but I will rise. And all of my called out ones will rise as well. Your fate is sealed. You have been defeated, but I shall come out victorious. He's the resurrected God. Come on, lift your hands. Give him praise this morning. The enemy is defeated. The enemy has no power over you. He will remain. He will remain defeated and conquered. But you and I shall rise in glory. You and I shall rise to glorification. You and I shall rise to victory. The resurrected king. The resurrected king. So we not only have evidence, but we have the hope that we too shall rise. The devil is already defeated. Christ has won the victory. Just lift your hands one more time and thank the Lord this morning. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for rising. It was necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Our hope is in you. As you have risen, so shall we. We shall not remain in Sheol. We shall not remain in the pits, but we shall rise. Oh, death, where is your sting? Death shall be no more. Death shall be thrown into the lake of fire. Suffering shall be no more. Crying shall be no more. But as he is, so shall we. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. While we're in this atmosphere, just lift your hands one more time. Let me bless you. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord's countenance be turned towards you. And may the Lord give you peace. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Come on somebody, give God glory this morning. Hallelujah. 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 Before we, before we leave church, let us worship the Lord with our giving. Hallelujah. The altars are open. I'm not sure who, who uh, we'll do it old school. Just bring it to the altar. <laughs> All right. But well, we worship the Lord. All the, all the young people, before you leave, see Miss Gloria. She has a little something for you over here. Hallelujah.